As we begin, I have a couple of announcements for you this morning. That was my first announcement. <laughs> what a joyful time it is. <laughs> uh, we do have several things going on over the course of the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> Act Teens, don't forget, you have an activity after worship is over today. So Act Teens over in the Family Life Center. Um, this coming Thursday night is Ladies Bible Study. Any ladies invited to come and join them, they meet at 6 o'clock. If you've never come, come and join them. It's informal. They would love to have you. That is, this would be the best night for you to come and see what the group is really like. <laughs> Coming up this Thursday night, a special time. But really, any ladies involved, you, you're welcome to come and join them Thursday night at 6 o'clock. There's a couple of activities going on this Saturday. The primary one here at First Baptist is a happy birthday Jesus party for all of our children. Uh, those kids age about 4th through 5th, 6th grade, come and join them this Saturday morning. It's going to be a lot of activities, a lot of fun. Our Act Teens are sponsoring that. You're going to have a great time. Also coming up this Saturday, many of our folks have been to Camp Good News, and uh, they are having a work day at Camp Good News from 9 to 12 Saturday morning. If you can give an hour uh, to show up down at Camp Good News and give them a hand with some different projects and things. It would be greatly appreciated. And then also want to remind the choir, don't forget there is choir rehearsal this Friday evening. So just make a note, a reminder about choir practice coming up uh, this coming Friday evening. Next week, several activities going on. Next Wednesday night, a week from Wednesday night, will be our annual carols, candlelight, and communion service. It is one of our most special times. We'll meet on that Wednesday night at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary for that special service. And then the next morning, you are invited to come and have breakfast on the staff. Staff cooks breakfast for all of our church family and community, so come and join us on that Thursday morning for breakfast announcements in the weekly church bulletin, so make sure you get a copy of it before you go today. A number of other announcements there for you. We want to take some time to welcome those who are visiting with us today. It is not just a special time of the year, it's a special day of the week as we gather to worship. And we're delighted that you came to spend this hour in worship with us today. We've got a visitor's packet that we'd like to give you today to take home and look over the information about our church family and church ministry. But inside you'll find a visitor's card. And if you would, fill that visitor's card out during the service this morning. And then a little later when we take up our offering, if you would, put that offering, that visitor's card in the offering plate for us. We want to come by and welcome you without embarrassing you. So we ask our visitors, if you would, first-time visitors, remain seated. Church family, let's stand in honor of our guests and let's share a welcome song together this morning. All right, as you're going back to your places, you may be seated. Amen. I do have a couple of prayer requests I wanted to mention this morning, some of you know Brother Albert Pons had surgery this past week. His surgery went well, but he has had some complications from his surgery. He is still in the hospital, and uh, they really do covet your prayers today for Brother Albert. And then uh, also uh, Pala's brother, um, who they found unconscious in his home this past week, is in the hospital and uh, he was placed on life support last night so remember her brother's family and her family as well during this time brother randy hicks is going to come and lead us in a word of prayer
good morning. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna celebrate Christmas. And you might have in your house a nativity scene. You'll have a structure that looks like a, a stable or a barn. There'll be an angel hanging on it. Uh, there'll be Mary and there'll be Joseph. There'll be some livestock there. There'll be some, a cow, maybe a couple donkeys. There'll be some shepherds that'll be there and they'll have their sheep. You might even have some wise men there as well. And if you look at it and look closely, majority of the time, most of those figurines are either sitting, kneeling, or bowing down. Mm. And they're there because of the one that's in the center, the one, that, the baby that's born there, the one that's in the manger. They're bowing down to him. God has come, he's taken on flesh, and he's come into the earth, to the world, to be able to save us. In Psalms 95, verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. So this morning, as we begin our service, bow your heart to God. Let Him speak to you. Let Him use you in your life. Our Father, we come to Thee at this time. We thank You for this day You've given us. As we come, we thank, thank You for this time of the year as we celebrate the birth of Christ and what it means to us as Christians. We do lift up these that have been we spoken request, you know, Albert and Miss Powell's brother, we pray for them, pray for their families as well as you're going through this time. Yes. We do lift up the service this morning. We pray that everything that's said and done bring honor and glory to you. Yes. All these things we ask in your name, that we may hear you more clear, we may feel you more near, and we may love you more dear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, sing a song of Bethlehem, all shepherds watching there, and all the news that came to them from angels in the air. The light that shone on Bethlehem fills all the
just thank you for all that you've given to us to God, especially during this time of the year, family, friends, church family to God. We also have that charge that this song just spoke about, to go and tell, spread your word to God, speak of all your blessings and how you have given us so much and done so much for us. Now to God, we approach this season to God in this prayer time, uh, to God with open hearts, put your word in the pastor's mouth. Open our hearts. These things we ask in your name. Amen. as we continue to praise him this morning. Prince of Heaven.
of glory came to earth. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the Old Testament book of Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Undoubtedly the most familiar verse in that Old Testament prophet's book where he speaks of the place that the Messiah would be born. Micah chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verse number 2 this morning. And when you find that place in your copy of God's Word, are able to look on with someone this morning, I would invite you out of reverence to God's Word to bow your head with me this morning. And I would invite you to bow your heart before God. And take the next few moments of quiet meditation and invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments in quiet prayer time, then I will lead us in a word of prayer and read our text. Father, before you ever laid the foundation of the world and created it, you could look ahead and see that one night in a little town called Bethlehem, that the son you would freely give and the son that would freely come would be born in that place. Your word incarnate. God in flesh. So that we could know forgiveness. And have that relationship with you. What a special night. What a special season for us. May this morning and these next few moments as we observe your word and we hear from you know the message that you have for each of us. Thank you for your precious word. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the Bible says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratath, Though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you will, come, will he come forth to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old and from everlasting. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. The year was 1835. And a small boy was born named Philip Brooks. He would grow up and become a minister. In fact, in the mid-1800s and uh, late 1800s, 
would be considered one of the greatest preachers in America. In 1865, on Christmas Eve, he would be visiting the Holy Land. He would take a horseback ride from the city of Jerusalem on Christmas Eve to the town of Bethlehem for a five-hour Christmas Eve service at what is called the Church of the Nativity, an area traditionally thought near where Jesus was born. Three years after that visit, as another Christmas came around, he wanted to write a song for his children to sing in a Christmas program. And so he wrote the words to a song, and he handed the words to his church organist, whose name was Lewis. And he said, Lewis, I've written this Christmas song for our children. I'd like for you to write a tune to go along with the Christmas song. And by the way, Lewis, if it's good, I'll name it St. Louis. Well, the organist wrote the tune. And that Christmas, six Sunday school teachers and 33 children sang for the very first time St. Louis except you'd never know it as St. Louis. You and I would know it as the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. When we think of Bethlehem, that adjective little always seems to be there, doesn't it? It comes straight from Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 that calls Bethlehem little. It was a small town and it was out of that place that God would become a little boy and be born it's little interesting when you look at the Christmas story you will find if you take time to dig in and look at it like Randy shared the Christmas nativity scene in his devotion time this morning you would see that God had much of that first Christmas story in little and their significance I believe in it and so I want to share four little things of that first Christmas I want to share the place the pulsar by the way pulsar is the only word I could find that began with P that meant star <laughs> but wait there's significance in it so the place the pulsar the presence and of course the person, all of them small for a reason. Let's look at first the place, Bethlehem, called Little. It was called Bethlehem Ephratath. Ephratath was what the town was previously known as, and it separated it from another Bethlehem in the Promised Land. We're told about Bethlehem in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, but not on a good or pleasant or wonderful occasion. It was also an occasion of the birth of a child. But tragically, when that first little child was born, a son in the area called Bethlehem, his mother would die during childbirth. But later, Jesus would come and be born in that little place. And I want to say today that I believe that God gave us so much of that first Christmas in little. So that you and I might keep the focus where it's supposed to be. And I, I share this phrase, and I've shared it before, but it's important. It's important for this time of the year that we not let the festivities get bigger than the focus. And it's easy to do, I know. If you've got a family and children, or you've got grandchildren, it's tough to not let the festivities become more important than the focus. And I'm not telling you not to have festivities. They're wonderful. But I am sharing that Jesus was born in a little town called Bethlehem as a little boy so that we keep the focus where it's supposed to be. In the scope of the whole world, Bethlehem was a tiny little out-of-the-way place compared to its nearest large city, Jerusalem, about five or six miles away, which you could see from Bethlehem. 
It was tiny. But on that night, it was the focus of all of creation. All of the stars and the galaxies, all of the angels and heavenly hosts were paying attention to one little place called Bethlehem. A reminder to keep the focus and remember it's little. It might have been a little town, but the significance was immense. What about the pulsar? I shared that I used pulsar because I was looking for a word that began with P. My first one I was going to use was pointer. Well, it's what the star was, wasn't it? It pointed, the wise men, it pointed the magi to where the baby was. And I thought, pointer. But I thought, no, there's got to there's gotta be. So I pulled out that book I hated in high school, that thesaurus. I couldn't even say it when I was in junior high. Pulled out that thesaurus and said, names of stars that begin with P. Pulsar. That's not going to work in a sermon. Pulsar. But then I thought, eh, you know what, eh, they'll, they'll humor me with it. And then I got to thinking, you know, what is a pulsar? What, what is a star that's called a pulsar, and how is it a different from a supernova or a giant star? How does it differ? And so I began to look a little bit and realize that that a pulsar was a highly magnetic pulsating star in the sky. Very compact, but because it rotated, it would look like it was pulsating in the sky. Thus, it got its name pulsar. But here's what's really cool. I'm reading it going, yeah, I don't think they're going to like pulsar. I better go back to pointer. And then it said in the science book, it emits a beam of light that can only be observed when it is pointing at earth. It's not a beam that goes around like you drive by the airport early in the morning like some of you do and you see that one beam, you know, and it's going around and around. That's not what it is. It can only be observed when it's pointing at earth. And I said, it's perfect. Now, I'm not telling you it was a pulsating star that appeared to the wise men. We do know that it was an incredible, it was a supernatural star. It was different from all of the stars. But I can tell you that that one star had one job, and it was to point right to earth where that baby was going to be born for those magi to get there. Of all the stars and galaxies in the sky, there'd be one special star. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had written the Christmas story, I would have wrote it different. Jesus would have been born in Jerusalem. That's where the people were. That's where a king lived. I would have not had a single star. I'd have created a galaxy that looked like one of two things. I would have either created a special galaxy that night for the wise men to see that it was a big arrow. <laughs> that way. Or, then I thought, no, no, even better. Because if I'm creating galaxies, I'm going to create one that looks just like a manger with an arrow. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be good because then everybody could look up there and see this galaxy that was showed a, this constellation of a manger and era. No, God chose one star. And I think part of it is to remind us of what the focus is supposed to be all about. And it's not about all the majesty in heaven. It's about the majesty of heaven that came to earth and was born in a little town signified by one little star a star that was different from all of the other ones in that it wasn't a fixed point in in the sky it actually 
moved. Wow. They followed a star. There's a lot of things about Christmas that we don't really know or we get wrong. For example, um, if you have a nativity scene, as Brother Randy said, we put it in a stable or a barn. Well, you do know that in the Bible, there's nothing that says Jesus was born in a stable. It's not even in there. He was born in a ma- and laid in a manger that we assume would go where? In a stable. So we, he was, well, it never says he was born. I'm not telling you he wasn't born in a stable, but it doesn't say he was born in a stable. How many here, well, maybe the first, like me, the first Christmas song I think I ever learned was Away in a Manger. How many learned that song, Away in a Manger? It's awesome. I remember learning as a kid, Away in a Manger. You know, it's a great song. I remember learning it. So I did a little research on it and found out, do you know about something about the song, Away in a Manger? No one knows who wrote the first two verses. Unknown. No one has a clue who wrote the first two verses. A man named Thomas McFarlane wrote a third verse for the song, and then it became popular. So if you look it up, it shows that Thomas McFarlane wrote verses 3 and 4, but the first two verses, no one knows who wrote Away in a Manger. And part of that's significant in the fact that someone said, Maybe we don't know who wrote Away in the Manger because maybe when it was translated from the language it was written in to English, they got the translation wrong. Because the song is A-W-A-Y, Away in a Manger. And someone said, no, it probably was originally written A-W-A-Y in a manger. And I first read that and thought, yeah, that's awesome. It's not away far, but it's away in a manger. And I thought, yeah, they got it wrong, dummies. But then I got to think a little more and thought, no, they didn't get it wrong. Because it can't be a way in a manger. Because the Bible says what? There's only one way, and that is Jesus Christ, who would grow up and say the words, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And that song that I grew up in, probably the first Christmas song I ever learned, away, far away in a little place called Bethlehem, a baby boy was born. His name was Jesus. And he'd grow up and one day he'd die on a cross to pay for our sin. He's the way. And anybody that wants to go to heaven or come to the Father has to come through Jesus. It destroyed most of what I thought growing up. Not enough good things I could do, not becoming a member of the church, not being baptized but putting my faith and trust in that baby that was born, Jesus Christ, and giving God my life. Wow. And of course, I found out that the Bible said if you're willing to tell God you're sorry for your sin, and you're willing to trust Jesus Christ as the way, and you're willing to give God your life, that he'll forgive you, adopt you, and you'll know the way to heaven. Your choice, your decision, not anybody else's. Huh. The place, it was little. The pulsar, little compared to all the other stars in the galaxy. What about the presents? Well, we know that the wise men came, the magi came, and they brought gifts. By the way, those gifts were small in size. They weren't big. How many here remember growing up when you were a kid and they always told you good things come in little packages? How many thought the first time you heard that it was a lie? Come on, come on, yeah. Some of you are being honest, like, yeah. You can pick out the first gift, Jim. 
Biggest one under that tree. I'm taking it. Now I've learned that the best things do usually come in the small packages. The gifts presented to Jesus, small. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about those, but the significance in each of those little gifts, little place, little star, little gifts. Gold, tribute to a king. When they came, they came seeking, in their own words, seeking the king of the Jews. The significance of giving gold to that baby was we're giving it to the king that has come. Frankincense, a unique substance used by the priest. It was a kind of white in color. They would use it and mix it in holy oil and they would consecrate the priest with it. When the priest would be set aside or consecrated or blessed, they would use that frankincense to put on that with the oil and they would consecrate that priest. And the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is our high priest. Significant in the frankincense used to consecrate a priest and they give it to a baby who was our high priest. It was also used in sacrifices. They would add it to the sacrifice, and we know what Jesus came to do, don't we? He came to die on a cross and sacrifice his life. They would also, I learned this last week, they would also, in some occasions, put a little bit of the frankincense on what was called the showbread. Inside the tabernacle or the temple in the first room, there were a few objects. There was a golden lampstand, and there was a table that was called the table of showbread, and There would be a piece of bread, uh, a representative of bread on that table inside the tabernacle or the temple. And it was called the showbread. And they would put some of that frankincense on that showbread. And, And I'm thinking to myself, wow, they could have never imagined that they're giving frankincense. It would consecrate a priest. It was used in sacrifices, and they would put it on the showbread. And what would Jesus say later in his ministry? I am the bread of life. You see, a little gift, but incredible significance. And then they gave myrrh. Myrrh was used often in their culture and in their religion. The priest would be anointed with myrrh among holy oil and frankincense. But we also know that they used myrrh as one of the substances they'd use in embalming someone. And you think to yourself, well, that might not be an appropriate gift to give to a baby. We visited some family yesterday and Light of Pala's brother, and while we were there, they were discussing what might happen if he were to pass away and what we might do from that standpoint of funeral or cremation or burial or whatever and said well he really doesn't have anything and and Pala's mom said well I have an extra plot for Pala's sister who was there (laughs) with us and she said well I have it for you And, of course, her sister said, "Um, I hope I don't need it for a while. You know, but it was just kind of that thought of, well, we got it in preparation. Well, I don't really want to think about that right now. Myrrh to a baby. Something that would be used in embalming. And you and I can see the absolute amazing significance for that gift. Because Jesus would come to do one thing, and that was to die on a cross to pay for our sin. And he would be buried. Wow. The town was little. The star amongst all the other stars, little. The gifts and presents, they were little. They might have been small gifts, but the significance of it was immense. And then the person... That's what it's all about. It's all about that baby that was born. You know, last Sunday morning I shared a story of of a boy who was born with some slight mental uh, disabilities, and I shared a story about 
him and Christmas. And I'll share another children's story today, a true story. In a church, the children, the older children, the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade children were given the task of putting on a short Christmas play. Well, they were excited about it. And they began to, you know, wait for the teacher to tell them what songs they might sing or what they might do. And, and the teacher said, but this one's going to be different than any other Christmas program we've ever done before. The kids were still excited. And the teacher said, I would like for you to write your own short Christmas story for us to do in church. Whatever you want to do, however you want to portray the story of Christmas, you write it and do it. And the kids said about all kinds of ideas, Christmas story, let's do something a little different, but they didn't know what to do. But long story short, the night of the Christmas play begins. The children are there. The curtain opens. And on the stage are children in different costumes of, you know, all the Christmas things. There's um, there, there's a Joseph, and there's an angel, there's some donkeys and sheep and cattle, there's, there's angels, there's wise men, there's shepherds. Everything is there except for Mary. I mean, the whole stage is set for the nativity, except there's, there's no Mary. And they didn't really have a stable, so they had brought some bales of hay and kind of stacked them up. And Joseph was there in the front, and there was an empty manger, and the shepherds and everything were there, but still no Mary. And the crowd kind of sat there listening, watching, wondering who's supposed to say something. When they began to hear some really terrible groaning, and hard breathing coming from behind the bales. And one of the children then said, Mary is in labor. <laughs> Nothing else said. Everybody there, you hear this groaning and hard breathing going on behind the bale crowd sitting there watching and from the stage the side of the stage out walks a doctor <laughs> white gown stethoscope listens hears the moaning and the loud breathing walks behind the bales of hay you hear some more moaning and groaning, and then you hear a baby cry. And the doctor walks back around, stethoscope around his neck, white gown on, and says, It's a God! <laughs> and the curtain closes. I don't know if there's ever been a Christmas play get it more right than that, is there? They thought of it themselves. Wow. The Prince of Heaven. The incarnate Word of God. Born in Bethlehem as a little baby boy. The place was small. The star was small. The presents were small. And the king, when he came, was small. John Doan wrote of the Christmas story two lines that I think, at least for me, sum up what all of Christmas is. He wrote this. "'Twas much that man was made like God before, but 
that God be made like man much more. Genesis, the first book in the Bible, tells us that we were all created in the image of God. And one day, the perfect image of God, the perfect reflection, God's only Son, would come to earth in a little place called Bethlehem and be born. Don't let the festivities get bigger than the focus is. How big is God? Well, he's bigger than the world, bigger than the universe, bigger than everything. But on that night, just how big was that baby that was born? Oh, the package was small, but the significance was immense. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? God became a man born in Bethlehem, the Son of God, so that you and I could know forgiveness. We could know and have a relationship with God and spend eternity in heaven, but it's your choice. And if you're willing to come to God his way, tell God you're sorry for your sin, confess it, the Bible calls it, and you're willing to put your faith and trust in God's Son, Jesus Christ, and you're willing to give him your life, the Bible says that God will forgive you and adopt you. You'll be able to spend eternity in heaven not based on whether we've done enough good, good works or not, or whether we've gone to church or anything else. The beauty of the Christmas story is that God came for you and loves you, and Jesus came. It's your choice. And if you'd like to know more about it, you'd like to settle it, you'd like to put your faith and trust in Christ this morning. In a moment, we'll have an invitation, and I'll be standing right down here at the front and when folks are coming to pray, I'd invite you to just walk down that aisle, come to me, I'll be standing right here. And we'd like to take a few minutes of your time before you go today and sit down with you with God's word and show you, here's how you can know. It's your choice. And only yours. To my brother, sister in Christ, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment today. It may sound simple, but I can tell you in the next few weeks it'll be difficult to keep but I trust you will. And that is to make a commitment to say, I'm not going to let the festivities become more important than the focus. God, help me to keep the focus most important. And I'd invite you to this altar just between you and God to say, God, help me to do that today. Maybe there's somebody that you know is going to have a tough Christmas. Maybe... They've lost a loved one this year. Maybe it'll be the first Christmas without. I'd invite you to come to the altar and pray for them. That they'll be able to know the joy and peace that comes even at Christmas. Despite what may be going on in their life. And it may be something else. But I'd invite you to come and pray for someone today. You know our altar's always open for that. Father, I pray that you bless our invitation time now. May we be willing to be obedient in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning and our invitation's open. And I invite you to come. Come on.